Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. I am Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, Matt Doyle, Kalen Carr, no David Goss, coward, coward. <laughs> he goes to Austin, he puts butt in seat at Q2, and he doesn't have the wherewithal, the fortitude, to show up today. He would, d- wouldn't even come on. He said, guys, I can't. No chance. No possible way. After Weeby took all that flack, after he was the lightning rod for in the <laughs> entirety of the city of Austin, I ruined it for them. I gave them their first L at home, and he won't show up. Mm. Mm. For shame. For shame, David. Anyway, he had to get on a flight in the, the hotel room. The checkout was early. So, yeah, that's why he's <laughs> not here. But it might be because he's a coward. He could be potentially... A coward. What's up, guys? He is, he is a coward. He he does avoid conflict, right? Like, yeah. Like oh. he, he's just like shrinking super violent real. David Unle- Goss. <laughs> Unle- I mean, unless it's on the field. Yeah. If it's on the field, then he seeks conflict uh, out. But that's like, his, I, I, yeah, that's he's a yeah. heat-seeking conflict machine. <laughs> yeah. I played men's league with him a couple times. No, he he likes it when it's good. He's a luxury player. He likes it when things are good. We're in Seattle. Yep. Everybody's coming up. We're good vibes. Three 0 win. And then he goes to Austin, he's trying to distance himself from Weeby, I think, ahead of time. He was strategically trying to be like, I am not with him, I'm with y'all. And uh, Even threw in the y'all, that that's like, right, he threw in the y'all just to, was, you yeah. know. He's, he'll, he'll pander like, anybody. Dave, you're from Long Island, man, you don't say y'all, I've never heard <laughs> you say y'all. Uh, anyway, a great week 10 in Major League Soccer, we will take you through it all. Coming up today from the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios, the best thing that we saw this weekend, there's some good stuff there. Uh, Cincinnati, one of the best things that we saw. I mean, they're in the playoff field. Doyle's writing about them as if they're a playoff team. He's saying this is going to be a playoff team, and that's not even leading his column. Did, did I get that wrong, though? I saw the. Well, I mean, I say they, they're playing like a playoff team. Okay, I would not be surprised if got they're a it, playoff got team. Got it, got uh, it. That's very. Uh, there's, that's no very baron- there's no guarantees gotcha. happening here. That's very, very lawyer like of you. Uh, you got attorney, attorney privileges there for you on that one. We'll talk about some season changing injuries. We haven't really jived into the Jao Paulo stuff. You know, we did the whole celebration after the CCL final, but we haven't got into the long term sort of knock-on effect for the Sounders, who are tied with the Whitecaps for the spoon right now, so they have some room to make up. We'll talk about Miles Robinson, and that is um, – that's a real that's gut a punch, bummer, man. man. It's Oof. just it's just awful to see uh, for a young guy who'd made such a huge impact for the U.S. and qualifying for Qatar. Now it seems won't be able to be there. I mean, uh, modern medicine is crazy, but I think the timeline feels pretty tight there. Top two teams in both conferences, Shield leaders LAFC – Hosted Philly, 2-2 draw, good game there. Austin uh, didn't didn't win at home, so we, we established that, just, just reminding you. Montreal did, however, whooped up on Orlando. We'll talk through that one and all the other results. Plus, hit the mailbag for some Club World Cup and uh, free space discussion as well. Congratulations before we get into things uh, for our fantasy league Wait, winner. hold on, real, just oh, real quick. Go ahead. Is this the first extra time post ccl win like uh in this yeah. new era of it, would you say correct. this is like extra time 2.0 at this point like yeah uh, well th- th- oh. th- that was a marker right i don't know i think how many how many point o's are we on for extra time extra time 1.0 would have been like world cup 2010 right right yeah 2.0 would have been the continuation 3.0 probably would have been when like lawless and sagini were moved on and i came mm-hmm. into the fold with borg and Fershaw. 4.0 would have been when Fershaw left. I start hosting with Borg, and we're rotating people in. I think you'd say that's the era when Dave became a host. Yeah. So he's in 4.0. 5.0 is the departure of Simon Borg, uh, which very tough. Uh, and I, I, I'm forgetting who was Moving with us at video. that time. Moving yeah. the video, also well, very tough. 6.0, yeah. I'm going to say, was the Bobby Warshaw Doyle era. <laughs> 7.0 is going to be on video. 8.0 is in pandemic. 9.0 was post pandemic via Zoom. I think this is extra time 10.0. I think we're. I think this is version 10. <laughs> I think at 10. this point it's like extra time Vista or something yeah. like that, right? Don't you drop <laughs> the, like, like what's our? You know what's the what's the noise when you boot us up? Uh, it's so like named after one of Elon Musk's kids. I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh boy. Uh, okay. So yeah, we'll get into all that. We got a lot to talk about. W- let's just start uh, with the. Let's start sort of. Let's say it again. Thank you, Seattle. You know, because we did the post game show, it was amazing. The best thing in this sport is being on the field when someone wins something, and we knew that we needed to be there if MLS was going to win the Concacaf Champions League. And by God, we were there, and it was magnificent. And that is in large part thanks to all of the listeners, all of the people, all of the soccer fans in Seattle, whether they pulled on the rave green on that night or the navy and gold of Pumas, because Pumas was out in force, and it was it was just. 
first of all, Kaylin, we both agreed that the the fashion wise, Pumas oh. run circles around basically everyone in, in oh the my hemisphere. God. I saw I mean, the, sweater the drip I, is oof. sweaters, ponchos, unlicensed kits, just like everything bandanas the whole it's so thing good was incredible. Their, their, yeah. their whole look is so good man yeah it's it was jean wonderful jackets i saw it the, ge- the cut off jean jacket with like the shearling underneath so it was sleeveless <laughs> with the pumas logo i mean people were vibing their on that tifo front. game was strong too they threw it, it up was. at the yeah, very end which mm-hmm. was cool yeah uh, was very happy just to be there was happy that it was i mean an environment that i'll never forget sold out obviously you had the big pumas section up there but the boom boom clap the the march to the match Everything about it was better than I could have dreamed it, uh, including the result, thank God. And and I was fortunate enough to be – we were down on the field getting ready uh, to do the show, like in position or whatever, to run out on the field once it happens. And that was when Nico scored his goal, and he jumped the board right by us. And the rule the, – well, I don't know. You're not supposed to get that close, but I, I couldn't help myself. I, like, ran. I slid <laughs> underneath the cameraman's shot and was just like – you know, filming Nico and getting a good close up there, and I think I might have yelled "Grande, que grande Nico" a couple times. I was just like in my in a in my happy spot, uh, but to be showered with confetti, you know, to have a little premature celebration go down and go down in infamy, uh, so to speak, <laughs> it, just all of it was just an absolutely perfect night. Though I want to get your perspective watching from afar. We haven't gotten it from you so far, and then we'll get to week ten. So, uh, what did you what did you see, feel, hear? Yeah, it it, it was. It was something else. And, and I'll just say that, you know, watching this unfold from my perspective, um, who's been there since since before day one, right? I've been an MLS fan since before there was ever an MLS game played. And um, I, I think back to when the Galaxy won their CONCACAF title, the CONCACAF Cup back then. Um, and all, the, all that kept running through my head was that the Galaxy did it without playing a single game in their home stadium. So should Seattle's title come with an asterisk? Because, <laughs> oh like, God. technically the Galaxy oh had a harder path. And so that's, I mean, that is I, basically my take on the whole thing. Yeah, I thought the it's, D.C. fans that were like, how could you forget us? Like, technically, Sounders worth it. How could you? Like, come on, guys. It's not about you in this travel. moment. This it's is not a bad, yeah, exactly. I mean, the other thing is like the people like missed the, you. The though, club, though. the club World Cup was called off. That technically, we don't have any evidence that Seattle or that LA would not have won the Club World Cup. So, like, really, this is just another example of Seattle following in the Galaxy's wake. And congratulations the, to Seattle. The, the for candles all that. that are forever uh, perpetually lit in my shrine over here just flickered. They just they felt that it's like you know they're like yes we grow in strength in power from this take from Doyle. But people missed you, Doyle. I mean, again, to say thank you to all the people that showed up on Tuesday night at the Georgian Dragon, that was mind-blowing. David Goss said, hey, I think 15 people are going to show up, so we should be prepared for this to be pretty low-key. I bet him 50, and I want to say that when we showed up, I think there were 50. Like, we walked in the front door 30 minutes early, and there were is just full of Sounders kits. And I, I want to say we probably hit 150, maybe between 150 and 200. And it was an absolute pleasure to meet all of you, to talk soccer with all of you, to just be reminded that sitting here in, in my basement, um, you know, a little bit isolated from the world at large sometimes with this show, that it's not like that, that this show occupies whatever space it is in your life, a little one as you drive, you know, to work on a Monday or drive home from work on a Thursday, whatever it is, uh, it's great to be in that space. So we really appreciate it. And was, we'll, was we'll this drag really Doyle fun? there. Was this really fun? Because like going out and like like meeting random people who who just like want to talk to you, that sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> that just sounds like being you're trapped in a room with them. Everybody's like had a couple. Technically, too there many, was a so there was a, technically a there was a patio that you could have escaped to. But no, I think I think the way this went down, you know, noted lover of all things fans, Kalen Carr was not able to be there, which was a real bummer. Obviously, mm-hmm. you couldn't be there. You are the uh, you're the Matt Damon to our Jimmy Kimmel in this sense. <laughs> but if you were to choose, Charlie might be there. If you were to choose two extra time hosts who would really be delighted by this, and my wife always says after I like somebody uh, somebody recognized me in an airport or something like that, like. Very rarely does this happen. She's like, you're freaking glowing right now. Dave and I were <laughs> loving it. Dave and I just had a great time. Like it's, 
It's it's our people, man. It's where we want to be. That's it's it was for us. And Anders, by the way, Anders <laughs> and Hans Arhus were the stars of the show. I believe that. Everybody I wanted to meet Anders. Believe that. And Hans was like Hans was like, This is kind of dumb. Why are we here to start? And <laughs> Anders' his father. And then by the end of it, he's like, he's holding court with people. He's like, Oh yeah, Anders, that's my son. That's my son. So it was it was uh, it was awesome. It was really awesome. Uh Weeby, everybody saw how much fun you had. Everybody <laughs> saw how much. Well, you know, it, it, it happens to everybody. You know, it, it happens to every. So, so, you know, you get excited and you just sometimes, you know, you pop. Can I just say, yeah, that was. Uh, I know we're going to go to like the moment of the weekend, <laughs> but that was mine. That is it. That, that is, was this the moment right? of the like, year. I can't was... believe that gif is real. I cannot believe that's real. <laughs> you know, and when for it those happened. That it, well, I experienced it in real time. Yeah, I was an innocent picture. bystander uh, at the moment. And I saw him pull over the champagne bottle, and I was like, you know, just kind of scrolling through Twitter or whatever I was doing on my phone and minding my own business. And then all of a sudden, oh, boy, it, everything <laughs> happened. Uh, and the best part was, like, your reaction afterwards was just of genuine sorrow. Just yeah. pure I, sadness. I'd spent like two or three days saying we should have a champagne bottle with us. Yeah, you to worked celebrate. with the PR. Yeah, I was like, we got to get, get this. In. Like, it's so important to me that we have this for like whatever dumb reason. Like, who knows where my brain goes in that sense? Mindy watched it. Uh, my wife, Mindy watched it. And she, <laughs> the first thing she said to me when I got home, we were talking about it. Was she said, "You do this all the time, not in the way you're oh. thinking." Not the way you're thinking. I know how that came out. I know how that came out. Not in the way that you're thinking. That is, in the, that, in the, is the, <laughs> that is the that is like the verbal version of that gift. <laughs> you do well, do that all the time. No, Come not on. in that way. Not in that way. In the sense that she says, "I blame inanimate objects for my own failure." She's like, "You do. You're all the time. Like you drop something. Like you drop something this. on on your foot, and you're like." Oh, this brick. How could this brick do this to me? And that's what I was thinking at the moment. I was like, how could this bottle of champagne do this to me? Like, what is, what is going on here? So, you know, look, I was just trying to take off the, like, you know, the have the wire top. And, you know, I've popped some bottles of champagne in my time. And normally they don't do that. But, you know. <laughs> well. Well, I hope we everyone. Gotta, we I hope talk every- soccer, man. We can't talk soccer. We can't talk soccer. Crying. We can't talk soccer. <laughs> I, that is uh, was an unintentional <laughs> moment of uh, you know. Well, I. I oh boy. Uh, not like that. Not like that. Anyway, it was a wonderful time, and uh, that gift, that video, will live on in infamy. And uh, my entire family roasted me for it yesterday at the Mother's Day get together we had. And I, when I saw it, I almost, I, I was, we were like this when we saw it after the game. We were giddy. We finished the show, and in the moment, it was. I didn't know anybody captured it. Thomas, our producer on the back end, of course, doesn't even ask me; just puts it out. Uh, and I, we were crying. We were literally on the field in <laughs> tears. It was the perfect, uh, the perfect end. <laughs> To a perfect week. Anders in the chat. Welp, this is not getting better. It's <laughs> not getting better. Please get to the soccer. My God, make it end. <laughs> Let's make it end. All right, we had a great time. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, who listens, who is a part of this little community, who came up to us, whether it was at our meetup on Tuesday or we were walking around before the game. Uh, just there were so many people that came up and said hi, and it really, it really means everything. Uh, to us, it makes this show feel like something more than five friends talking soccer twice a week, which it absolutely is. We, you know, we're all great friends, and and that was probably my highlight of the week of getting to be with Anders and Dave and with you, Kaylin and Abner, uh, with us as well, who who helped make this all happen, right? and then all the the people we experienced it with. That is uh, that is special stuff. Okay, what's the best thing you saw in week ten? Doyle, compose yourself. <laughs> what's the best thing you saw? Uh, it was that gif. Um, but other than that gift, the best thing I saw was, was just the whole LAFC Philly game on, on Saturday night. Like, these are two elite teams, and they went at it for 90 minutes. It got chippy. There were some great goals. Uh, like, it, they're, like, this was just a really, really high-level uh, MLS regular season game. We're, we're going to talk about it more later in the show, but, like, that was the best thing I saw. I was locked in on that game. And it's incredible that we got that with LAFC's big, quote-unquote, big pieces. And you pointed this out well in your column. But I, I've been yeah. thinking this for a while. It's like, they're not actually playing at, at top no. capability right nope. now. So that that's going to be incredible. Currently, Shield leaders. Kalen, best thing you saw? 
I'm going to go with the um, perspective U.S. number nines. Um, most specifically, Jesus Ferreira adding to his tally, um, scoring a nice goal, especially I, I think the way the goal was scored. It was, I think, a dummy from Mariola and um, kind of a little bit. Of, he's in that soft spot right on top of the D, which I think as that false nine system that we're going to see with the national team is a space that he's going to be able to um, exploit. And then the other one was Brandon Vasquez. Uh, you know, you mentioned before three games in a row, a new record for FC Cincinnati. Um, Doyle is even hyping him up for the playoffs, which you love to see. But uh, I mean, I think his movement just on that goal too as well, just instinctive. He drags him one way, then senses to come back around. Um, nice, easy finish, but the movement to get to that place um, was was fantastic. So I was keeping an eye on the other ones. Jossi and uh, Jeremy uh, Ibobasi were playing. They, they both got chances, didn't score. But I just think this number nine competition or, you know, late arriving runners in the box, to use a, you know, soccer term, is just like, I think it's going to be a fascinating thing to watch because that, that spot is still um, one where you, you've generally seen, even in the history of U.S. national teams, players enter the picture late and make it to a World Cup team. Um, when you look back to Edson and you look back to Herc Gomez and some guys who have, Robbie Finley, some guys have been able to find their way. Um, so I think uh, that was my most exciting thing to go. But Jesus still still kind of got a hold on it right now. Yep, he is tied for the golden boot in MLS with Sebastian Driussi on seven. Also, by the way, passed his father, David, for most goals between father and son in MLS. David had 24 in his time in MLS, of course, was an MVP, and right now Jesus is uh, on the path to at least be competing for that. But 25 goals in his MLS career for Jesus Ferrer. Pretty cool for him to pass his dad in that sense. Uh, my best thing I saw, you know, Austin fans, I'm not going to drag you here, but, well, no, no, not going to drag you here. But the T-shirt that Doyle tweeted out, I don't know if you put it in your column. You said it was going to be the face of, your, of the week. <laughs> yeah, it's down at the yeah. bottom, Weeby. Yeah, so uh, I got in the DMs. Of the guy who made that T-shirt, who is like big Austin guy, you know, he says Austin FC is a lifestyle in his uh, in his profile. Um, he is going to send me one of those shirts, so I will be rocking. Uh, don't stop. What is it? Don't, keep doubting us. Uh, T-shirt with Danny Pereira on it, and I'm thinking about getting bonus game on the back. So let me know what I should get. But he's like, do you want Weeby? What do you want? I was like, I think it has to be bonus game. So uh, big thanks to him. I'm going to go on their podcast as well here to talk soccer after the LAFC Austin game too. That's not the best thing I saw. It's Montreal. Um, I don't know whether to call them CF Montreal or the Montreal Impact or whether it's acceptable to just go back to the Impact, but they have a new crest coming this summer. That's what the club is saying. That's awesome. They're also seven games unbeaten, five of those wins. CCL did a number on them, as it does many teams in this league, uh, including, including we see the Sounders, who we'll talk about in a little bit, but they beat down Orlando, and they've been beating some teams down. Georgie gets another goal. Waterman comes up from CPL, gets a goal. Uh, they are absolutely rolling, and it's good to see Wilfred Nadze uh, getting his guys uh, in a place where, where they can be truly uh, perhaps even maybe down the line shield contenders, but certainly a playoff team and one that's going to make some noise. All right, let's get into your column, Doyle. If you don't, risk, if you don't read uh, the Armchair <coughs> Analyst every Sunday night, which I really appreciate you putting out <laughs> early for me, uh, do so. Of course, Monday morning it's easier as well when you wake up. But your uh, big takeaway is what? What do you want to talk about? I mean, let's talk about Cincy, right? Because th they're three three wins in a row. Um, they're doing it like they're beating the teams they should be, like uh, Toronto. But in this weekend, they went up to Montreal or to Minnesota rather, and they beat a pretty good Minnesota team in Minnesota. They have. <clears throat> Uh, you know, match winners in, in Brandon Vasquez and Lucho Acosta. The, their new DP D-mid has looked apart through 180 minutes. They crushed it in the Super Draft. Like, they get three contributors from, from one Super Draft this year. And so they're, they do not only have guys who can um, win you a match on their own, which we've seen from Lucho Acosta and now Brandon Vasquez as well. They just have fewer weak links. And so we're a third of the season, a third of the way into the season now. They're in fifth place in the Eastern Conference. And the underlying numbers think they're even better than that record. And like when the team's playing well and passing the eye test and they're collecting points, not just at home against weak teams, but like going on the road against pretty good teams and, and getting, getting results at the very least, or in this case, a, a win. Um, and then the underlying numbers are actually saying, hey, you should pay attention. This team's actually pretty good. Um, it feel it feels like this is 
a team that has jumped from the very basement, like the worst soccer ever played in MLS. I thought they would be 10, 12 points better this year. They might be 20 points better. This might be a 50-point team. This might be a, even, you know, 55-point team feels achievable, if not exactly probable. And if you're flirting with that, yeah, you're flirting with, with being a playoff team. And it's happened so quickly. I did not see it coming this year. I did, I did not see this coming from FC Cincinnati. I don't think any realistic person did, um, but it's here. And, and like, we're, we're a third of the way into the season, man. It's, it's not just a phase at this point. Like, that's a big chunk of 2022. They've been playing really, really good soccer. Um, and, like, after what Cincy fans have been through the past three years, they deserve it. They, they deserve to see something like this happen. What a gift uh, Lucho Costa has been. Oh, my God. To them, by the way. I mean, you already know that we love him on this show, and the Lucho era will live in, in infamy. Uh, but it kind of seemed like maybe at Atlas, I don't know, it kind of seemed like maybe he had dropped off a little bit. Yeah. It seemed like I mean, he wasn't, wasn't the same player. It wasn't player. a good fit, right? Yeah, it was yeah. A but bad fit. You put him in he's... here, you you put runners ahead of him, and they, they play with the two-striker system. The outside backs are pushing forward. He's just, he finds space so well. On the on the goal, the game-winning goal, you go back and watch that play, rewind back from, you know, the really obvious points of like, okay, through ball, here's Calvin Harris across, great movement by Brandon Vasquez. I don't know what Minnesota is doing because Lucho Costa is the king at being in a wide area or sort of like just chilling in a channel and then slowly walking his way into the perfect place to receive a ball where space is going to go open up often on the opposite side or of receiving a ball in midfield and just turning people of having that touch, having that faint, having that little bit of a body shift. And all of a sudden he's off to the races. I've been watching his basically his clips of key passes over the last couple weeks. Like as I saw the, as I saw the gap of key passes, of expected assists, of just like chance creation between him and everybody else, just for fun, because we have those tools on the back end, I can literally go into a database and be like, show me every single one of these videos and cycle through them. The spin, the weight on the balls, his ability to create a space for himself to get free, but then also to create angles is just so fun to watch. And I, I know that people are watching Vasquez on that final goal, but go back and watch the and it's a simple pass. It should be, I guess, when you watch it as a layman for number 10. But his ball to Calvin Harris, he has the patience. He has the timing. He waits for it to set up, for the run to come. And then the ball he plays, it almost, as I'm a golfer now, almost looks like it has that check spin. Like, it, it starts fast, and then it hits a certain point where it just starts slow rolling to where Calvin Harris knows that ball's not going out of bounds. He knows nobody's getting to it, and he can just have his head up and, and understand exactly where it's going to be in any given moment to put his foot through it right to Brandon Vasquez. Lucho Costa is a joy to watch. We have, a, we have Matt Skinner here, here saying, Kalen, is he a legit MVP candidate or not? I would have to say, oh, for sure, he's a legit MVP candidate. He, he is just amazing. I'm going to skip the MVP part, but I, I think he is a wonderful player. And But I think if you look back and you remember towards his early time in D.C., he really wasn't uh, a breakout star until Rooney came. And he's the type of player that you really need to have a system around, and he needs to have people to play off and with. And there are some people that he connects with and some that he doesn't. And at times, even with Cincinnati in the past, I would still turn on the games and watch him play because he's just that fun to watch. But oftentimes it was like, him trying, he takes risks, right? That's how he plays. He'll play a little short one-two, or he'll try and go for a meg, or do something cheeky. And he sees the game a little bit different than a lot of other players that he plays with. But when you didn't have any protection, which at the time it seemed like they were using Kubo mostly back there, and there just wasn't a lot of protection there. And then on top, you had Brenner, who was mostly a speed option to stretch the field, but not somebody that you're going to look to kind of play and bounce the ball in and off of. Um, so I think Brandon Vasquez and going with the two-striker formation has definitely helped a lot. Um, and then I think, to Doyle's point, adding in some defensive solidity in front of that back line, um, I think with Noel Bodo and Moreno, um, having those two kind of like behind him to kind of protect him will allow him to get into those spots where you get him on top of the box and that's happening in more advanced positions as opposed to being in your own half or closer to the sideline and he can get a little bit more connected who is ian murphy doyle he's <laughs> just a draft pick i don't even <laughs> I, I, yeah, he, I saw his name in your column i'm like this guy looks like a mls center back to come and you know you try to watch as much as you can but sometimes i have to cheat a la going and watching all the key passes from lucho who who is ian murphy like 
And who is it outside of the obvious guys here in, in Vasquez and Lucho that's making this a reality? Uh, I mean, pr- let, let's you know, let's let's be up front. It, it is Vasquez and and Lucho. Both guys are playing at a best eleven caliber, right? Like Lu- Lucho's underlying numbers are. Um, in terms of chance creation, Historic. they're ahead of what they're, yeah, they're ahead of what Carlos Hill did. Hill did last year when he won MVP. Like it, if you're in that company, you're, you're doing something right. Um, I think the structure has a lot to do with it as well. Like Pat Noonan, like settled really quickly on the three five two, and I know they've had to go away from that for a couple of games because of injuries, but. Playing that formation with, with Lucho is just like a classic 10 underneath two forwards. It does all the stuff that Kalen said in terms of giving him runners to play off of, to find space underneath, and then to unlock defenders or, or defensive midfielders who are trying to deal with three things at once. And and everything that, that since he has done in the past has been so slow um, and predictable that he was never in those good positions. And one of the things that we saw last year especially – or, you know, was him dropping back all the way past the defensive midfielders to pick the ball up off the back line and try to shuttle it forward because they didn't have anybody who would do that. Now, Junior Moreno has helped with that quite a bit. Like, I, I still think that the amount that they paid for him in allocation money was probably a bit of an overpay, but when you're able to just constantly trade the number one spot in the allocation order for 250000 like an ATM. 000, like, it's... The, like it, it's no longer an overpay. Um, the 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 new demid whose name uh, Nuobodo, um, like like he has obviously helped a ton in the past two games. Uh, and then Ian Murphy, who they took, he was from Duke. He was, you know, they picked him. I think 14th overall, uh, and he's like he's just slotted in and given good minutes as a competent center back in that back three. And it's all kind of working together. Um, you know, I think Jeff Cameron is playing at a higher level than he did last year. I think Nick Hagland has been pretty decent this year. Um, you know, even Alvis Powell ha- has, has helped. He's still Alvis Powell, right? He's not going to give you anything in the final third really, but just his ability to carry the ball forward in a structure that makes sense um, it, like it, it, it's, you're seeing it game after game after game. And I, I think Pat Noonan and, and Chris Albright deserve a, a ton of credit for that. And the, like the, I mean, soccer is an O-ring game, right? Like the, the weakest point is going to like, it can cause the whole thing to blow up. And just by having fewer weak points and, I, you know, we covered everything on the field in terms of the field players. The biggest one for, for Cincinnati over the past three years was goalkeeper. Like, it, it's impossible to overstate how much the goalkeeper situation harmed this team from 2019 to 2021. And 2022, they this winter, they addressed it. They, they went out and they signed Alec Khan, who had a couple of bad games, but I think four or five really good games uh, before picking up an injury. And then once he picked up that injury, they just slotted in Roman Salantano, who they took second overall in the Super Draft. I felt like that was a risk. I, I didn't think that Sal- – like, if you look at the, the the previous guys who have been top two picks, the previous goalkeepers who have been top two picks, it's Brad Guzan and Andre Blake. And I don't think he's that level of a prospect. But he's looked at so far. He hasn't put a foot wrong in, in four games – or three or four games – um, so they, like, they, they no longer have these just completely obvious weak spots that other teams can go at them and blow them up. Um, and that in turn has allowed Lucho to play higher and be a true number 10 and having, you know, Brandon Vasquez and Don Baji and Don Baji is a competent veteran MLS Ford. Those two guys together up top, they're going to put a lot of pressure on teams with their movement, with their physicality and, you know, it's it's just a very simple sort of, of uh, you know, blueprint for this team. And it's worked spectacularly through 11 games. You know, this is the Don Baji hive right here. Uh, we'll finish <laughs> here, Kaylin. You mentioned sort of the guys that might be able to sneak their way into a World <laughs> Cup roster. And we mentioned Brandon Vasquez getting a goal. And, and Brandon Barlow hit us up here on Twitter and says, does or should Brandon Vasquez get a USMNT call-up sometime this summer to see what he can do with the up-for-grab striker position? He's been in good form all season, and he's only looking like he's getting better. Seems like Haji Wright is going to get in. 
to these camps with Greg Berhalter, and he's talked a little bit about that. You can get the coverage on MLSsoccer.com and literally everywhere else because it's all people want to talk about, obviously. Uh, World Cup prep. Should Brandon Vasquez get a sniff? Uh, I think so. I think he's gotten – I think the argument for him as well is, like, one – um, he's got some, phys- he's got some physicality to him as far as his size goes. Um, he's got excellent movement in the box and what we're looking for from a number nine position with the national team isn't so much of you need to be able to do everything and create. Um, in some ways I think we're going to use the wings to kind of stretch the field and get him behind. And then you're looking for more of a finisher in the box. Um, and it comes in different forms, right? We've got the, the false nine with Jesus where he drops deep. He does have a little bit more to f- facilitate. This would be a different option as far as somebody that would be more in, in front of the, like leading the line, um, giving you a little bit more of an option as far as hold up play, which has been a sore spot, I think for the U S men's national team for a bit. Um, but I think for if you just look at his career, like he's had opportunities, but they've been fleeting. And when he's when he's missed chances, he goes back to the bench, right? And that's just by virtue of playing for Atlanta United. Whereas when you come to a place like Cincinnati, it's a better platform where he gets a run of games and he's able to get into a rhythm and he's showing you now how he fits into the system and finding that confidence. And I just, you know, as a former striker, domestic based, I still feel like. If you are a domestic striker right now in MLS, the best places for you are places like Dallas, Cincinnati, um, Colorado, San Jose. Places like that where you're going to get games, you're going to get minutes, you're going to get your chance to kind of lead the line. And uh, I think you're, we're seeing that with Brandon Vasquez. The thing I'll say about Vasquez is you know, chemistry matters as well. And you look at the national team, look at the guys that make up the core of the national team. You look at Brandon Vasquez's youth team career. He would not be walking into a group where he doesn't know anybody. Oh God! He would I not be. The, I hate the youth team argument. But you don't. I mean, just I'm, just, I'm like, I'm not saying it's on the field. I'm just saying from a inter, from like an interpersonal standpoint. Sure. It's yeah, not no, like a. It's not a weird deal to be like, oh, who's this guy? You know what I mean? Like it. I'm just. I, I do think that those things matter within teams. You would know better than I. But yeah, if you score goals, you you'll be friends with everybody. Everyone's yep. gonna love you. <laughs> That's a good point. Great point. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the we, – we, we tried to front load some positivity into this show, and I hope that we succeeded in, in doing that for about a half an hour. We're going to have to hit a little bit of, uh, you know, sadness, a little bit of sorrow here for Miles Robinson. Atlanta United, they'd scored three goals in their last five games. They desperately needed goals. They needed something positive. Well, they got, they got it in a result form, 4-1 against the Chicago Fire, who are now back in their customary place at the bottom of the Eastern Conference, now struggling <laughs> defensively. We won't, we won't go too much into the Fire – on this show it's more about atlanta miles robinson 14th minute non-contact goes down you can see the anguish the pain the sort of disbelief and frustration the anger on his face he's pounding the ground he's it's bad you know it's bad anybody watching can understand that it's not a good thing Uh, confirmation this morning by atlanta united that he ruptured his achilles he will have surgery today monday may 9th and uh yeah the timeline is is not kind. I saw something today from Henry Bushnell put out basically like I think it was like 173 days and is an NFL player, Cam Akers. I don't know personally know who that is, but 173 days uh, for him to come back from an Achilles injury. So modern medicine is indeed uh, very advanced and sometimes insane uh, with the timeline that things can take. There is a little bit of a precedent just a year ago, May 18th, Aaron Long had Achilles surgery. He was back, quote unquote, good to go uh, in mid January. It seems like the timeline for Miles, just it's not going to be there. It seems, you know, again, not a doctor. Don't play one on TV. Didn't stay at a, a certain hotel chain last night. It just seems like it's out of the question. And that, that Kalen, is, is heartbreaking uh, for Miles Robinson, who was such an important growing piece of this team and the success they had and the fact that they – made it happen, that they did the thing that they were supposed to do, which is qualify for Qatar. It was seems like it was going to be him and Walker, the chemistry that they'd built. You know, the I mean, they they shut people down in CONCACAF. Yeah. Like, what was it? Like the goal differential when they were on the field together was like 18 scored, three allowed. Yeah. yeah it it like was that. it yeah. was a special partnership. He is a special player, and he was on the brink of having a truly special, uh, unreplicable moment in his life and his career, and, and it seems like that is now gone. That, that's awful. 
Yeah, I remember talking to uh, Carlos Bocanegra at the draft in Chicago when they when they picked him, and I and I asked him like how how good do you think he can be, and he's like, I think this is a national team player, and I think he had to kind of wait for his chance a little bit longer under Taza until the change of regime, and then he took his chance, and from there you started to see it like you started to see the the. I think the, for me, the idea is just like how rapid his ascension was and how fast his development was worth like every step where sometimes you think, OK, yeah, you have a good couple moments with the national team, but then you kind of hit a wall. And we've seen that amongst the U.S. national team kind of like young player pool. And that's just a thing that happens amongst young players in general. But he seemed to just be very consistent, a couple missteps here and there, but but very consistently growing and growing and to the point where. Yeah, you feel for Miles, absolutely. And I'm always going to start with the player's perspective, but there's concern for the national team as well, too, because you saw how good those two especially were together. And I think of the national team and the center back position for me is is one that is very much based on relationships and building relationships and having time together on the pitch. And we saw that coming together with him and Walker. Um, so it's going to leave a void. But th there, we do have a, a number of other options there. But um, yeah, I mean, just for today, I mean, brutal for, for Miles. Darrell, any, any thoughts on the... No, I mean, it's, it's brutal for my. I think you guys have said it. Like, it, it's, it's hard for me. It's hard, I think, probably for most folks to think about it, probably even for Miles himself, to think about this in any other framing than, oh, damn, there goes the World Cup. Uh, to me, he's a start, you know, a starting eleven player. I, the the work that he and Zimmerman had done together, um, eighteen like we said, eighteen to three uh, goal differential. Um, I, I think that the Gold Cup that he had last summer is the single best tournament that I've ever seen a U.S. men's center back have. He was he was that good. He should have been, I think, MVP of of, of the Gold Cup. Um, and to have that all taken away with, with one bad step, um, it sucks. There are other frames that we have to, to view this through. Um, it, you know, obviously the personal one, and um, hopefully that he's getting the, the help and support. I'm sure he is getting the help and support he needs to come back from this um, and, and not let it, you know, cast a cloud over his whole life because I imagine that there would be a temptation to do that. Um, but one is, like, he he's not just... Atlanta's um, best center back. He was their captain in this game, and he's arguably their best player. And this happens as Atlanta puts together their best overall performance of the season. Um, what a gut punch for them! Now they they do have some potential answers. There it was Alex Dijon who who came on and um, you know gave, gave them. 70 good minutes against this fire team. Uh, George Campbell is probably going to get a, a lot of chances to, uh, you know, to make the job his own for the rest of the season, at least. They need Alan Franco to play better than he has played. Um, you know, he's maybe a guy who will start wearing the captain's armband now. Um, but it, it, you know, through that, like, I, I'm still bullish on Atlanta United. I think that. The, the chemistry that we saw this weekend with Araujo back and, and actually stretching the field a bit, not just coming back to the ball like Almada and, and Moreno type, like they, they tend to get in each other's way. And then Cisneros as well. Just like Cisneros doesn't even want the ball. He, he's just like, he's like, I'm just going to get in the box because it, these three guys behind me, good stuff's going to happen. And oh, by the way, he had a first half hat trick. He's about to win player of the week and he deserves it. Um, uh, like I'm still bullish on this team, even though it's been so hit and miss. And like Gonzalo Pineda has been is so bullish on this team. Um, it, like he he said last week after that loss in Montreal, he's like, it, you know, we're playing well. Like it's starting to happen for us. It's not showing up in the box score. And, you know, some of it wasn't even showing up necessarily in the underlying numbers because once they got to the final third, um, they weren't able to, you know, generate generate shots. Um, and like, if you don't generate shots, you don't generate XG. But if you look at all the stuff that leads into the final third, you could see it starting to snap into place. And then this weekend, it was just like an avalanche hitting this fire team. They were just completely overwhelmed. Um, and I'm, so I'm still bullish on, uh, Atlanta United, but if you, if you don't have an elite center back, you're not a real threat to win trophies. You're just not, um, 
right now I don't think Atlanta have an elite center back. Franco's supposed to be that. He has not been, nonetheless. I mean, George think of what's happened, like, right up that spine, right? With yeah. Guzan, Miles, Ozzy, Joseph. Joseph, it, yeah. It's, it's just one blow after the next. But you're right. They, they played they played well. It's crazy. Ronaldo Cisneros, this is his first goal, his second goal, his third goal in MLS. A pretty incredible debut uh, as far as the goal scoring form second, goes third, for him. And fourth, right? Oh, is it? Did I miss the yeah, other one? Yeah, he had he had one against against Miami. Was it a couple mm. weeks ago? Mm. Yeah, I think he does have one. That that yeah. feels like a bonus goal against Miami. <laughs> like, eh, I, nobody can remember that stuff. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's hit some mail real quick on this and take it outside the Atlanta side, which obviously is uh, is a big deal. Shakiri, by the way, had an assist in this game to Chinoso 04, but the fire are in a bad place, and uh, yeah, they're in a bad place. Matt Skinner, uh, did Aaron Long just re-enter the fold as a starting center back for the USMNT? Michael Milberger, shout out to Mike. Uh, who's going to be the uh, Jimmy Conrad, the surprise MLS center back of the 2022 World Cup for the USMNT? So who, sorts of, who sort of, how does the depth chart shuffle here? Um, you'd think that Chris Richards is going to be raising his I hand think- saying, hey, I got a chance here. Definitely Aaron Long, who seemed like, who seemed like he was going to be the guy before he got then hurt and then recovered and is now back in that position once exact again. Exact same injury. Exact same injury. Is just- yep. Aaron Long popped his Achilles May 15 of, of last year. Yep, and it was back, as I said earlier, in, in like mid-January. Uh, but he's back. He's playing well. You got EPB starting against uh, PSG in Paris, getting a big result for Troyes. I didn't say that right. So Trois. French speakers. Trois. Trois. Oh, tight. That's I like that. Uh, who else would be that? Mark McKenzie would be, at least in the conversation, with Cameron Carter-Vickers. Yeah. I know it seemed I like think- Greg was going to call him up even before this. Who else is floating around in that in that space? I mean, to me, uh, Richards and Long are probably slot right in to numbers two and three on the, on the depth chart behind Walker Zimmerman. Um, in some order, it's those two guys. I, you know, it, obviously that can change. There's six months left until the World Cup, so um, you know we could see form take a dip. We could see, uh, you know, God forbid, we could see other injuries. Um, but I think those two guys are pretty clearly it, but then it becomes a battle for that, for that next spot. And like, look, I'll, I've never been, um, a Cameron Carter Vickers guy. I I think that he gives up too much defensively in the air and he's, he's never been, um, a, 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 a plus passer from the back, but he, he did just have a monster year for Celtic. Um, and I, 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 very much suspect that he will be part of this Nations League roster so that Greg Berhalter can get a look at him. I'm not as high as Palmer Brown. I know he's been in camp. He played in, was against Costa Rica or was against Panama in, in uh, or no, it was against Mexico in the last round of qualifiers. Um, to me, he's still so blasé out there. He struggles defending the near post. He, he very late reading runs, which I think we saw this week. Granted, it was against Mbappe, but like his, his reads are very slow defensively. Um, but like he's been in camp before. We'll see him. We'll see McKenzie. He has had a terrible year in, in Belgium. He, he's not a starter. He barely plays, um, but he's got experience. So we'll see him. I don't think John Brooks is going to come back. I think that um, one way or another, some bridges were, were probably burned. Um, so it's, it's, it's tough to, it's tough to see for me to see a path back for him. But as to Milberger's question as to, is there a Jimmy Conrad, um, MLS based center back who's making a push and, and playing at that level? There isn't, there's like, there's some good center backs in this league, you know, domestic center backs in this league playing some pretty good ball. Um, but there's not really one who's, you know, sort of jumping, uh, you know, jumping off the page at you uh, the way that, you know, Long was in 2017 or, you know, Walker Zimmerman was starting in 2016 or Miles Robinson starting in 2019. The close would probably be Sean Nealis for the Red Bulls, but um, Nealis, I straight up do not think he has uh, the quickness and foot speed to be uh, an international defender that said that's what people were saying about jimmy conrad 15 years ago well i guess it would be 17 years ago now um so like maybe sean nealis but i think it's much more likely that the depth chart 
like the next guys on the depth chart after Richards and Long will be from that European based group. Um, and if I were to put my money on one, it would probably be Cameron Carter Vickers. To there go was a t- all the way in for for Mike because we love Milberger. Um, I would think I would throw your all your cards in on uh, Kessler if I'm. I if was just going to say that yeah. for the deep Good cut because it's like he's been in and around the group. Um, we know you know he's he's got the size, he's got some of those those qualities, but um, he would be. I think it would be a surprise, and there there are a lot of other options. But um, that would be sort of the one MLS guy that I could think of. If he was if he was playing well, right, and if the Revs were playing well defensively, yeah, then last year the, last year different time, different place, right. you know. Right. He played in the Gold. I mean, Donovan Pines played in the Gold Cup, right? Like it, Greg Berhalter went down. Austin Trusty is maybe one that like he and again he's not playing quite as well as he did last year, but like. I guess those are the three guys, but like none of them is making a, a rock solid case for themselves based upon their MLS play thus far um, in in 2022. Now, if we could get uh, M- you know Mamadou Mbaki Fall, if we could get him his citizenship sometime in the next couple of months, then <laughs> then we would all have an answer. But I don't think that's going to happen. Let's hear from Anders real quick and before we move on. Quote, this is Jackson Reagan erasure. <laughs> All right, let's keep it going here and talk Seattle quickly. FC Dallas 2, Seattle nothing. The uh, Seattle kids held on for more than an hour, but in the end, Jesus Ferreira and Paul Ariola got the job done. For Dallas, understandable that this would be an L for Seattle, who are now down at the bottom of the Western Conference and the bottom of the Shield standings. Vancouver had to uh, get a win via some luck on the refereeing side as well as some late goal scoring from our guy Tosan Ricketts to uh, move up from four points to seven to tie for the shield to drag somebody else into that conversation. Did you guys cover that on uh, Instant Replay? We did, yes. You should go <laughs> watch Instant Replay. There were a number of things. The Nathan call, except there, there were some things that you might okay. want to okay. check out on Instant Replay, uh, presented by Cheez-It, of course. Uh, so Dave Clark hit us up, and we'll kind of take this from the Seattle perspective because it's a good win for Dallas, but I think the, the bigger implication is probably for Seattle. Uh, from Dave, time to panic. From Sergeant Pickles, which is a real thing, I promise you. Uh, considering the Sounders are now down, uh, Jao Paulo, where are they in the standings? Uh, as well, is the Shield out of reach? Yes, uh, Sergeant Pickles, don't think about the Shield. If you have a trophy, don't think about the Shield. Just try to get in the playoffs. Should they focus on Open Cup and another good playoff run? Uh, obviously, yes. Uh, state of the Sounders right now, Kalen. We haven't really dug into the Jao Paulo injury. That is devastating for any team. And Anders, of course, says treble coming, uh, incoming uh, in the chat, which many people <laughs> wanted us to include in our YouTube feed, and I, I told them I'd rather have Anders uh, gainfully employed. So <laughs> a quad if you consider the Club World Cup. Exactly, Anders, exactly. So what now for the Sounders, Kalen? How should they approach the rest of this year, and uh, where do you think they'll end up at the end of the season in the standings? One thing I will say is getting closer to the Sounders fans um, with Anders and, and the crew Gave me a little bit more insight into some of the the mindset of the Sounders fans <laughs> and like some of the uh, like people were going you know immediately starting to talk about Club World Cup and then the the, the season and where they're going to finish. So I, I mean it's part of what makes them so special, but um, like in a in a good way. Um, but also I think this was like obviously a game where you just look at the lineup they put out there. It was going to be very difficult for them to um, to really kind of like challenge traveling on the road after the emotional high I mean, they forced Dallas into some changes man like like, like Estevez had to scrap that 4-3-3 they went to a, like a kind of a 4-4-1-1 right and then so like sorry I'm, I'm interrupting but Seattle like no, those kids a... those kids came out and they they yeah they for made the it first tough. 60 minutes right but that's where you start to put in I think they made a, a number like three changes at uh, once in the second half um, and brought in some of the more experienced guys like Roldan and um, uh, I believe who else did they put in? They put in a couple Rusnak other. Rusnak came in. Rusnak, yeah, as well, yeah. So I just think it's more when you start the game starts to stretch a little bit, and you're used to making other subs, and you're putting in guys that just came off of putting in a huge shift. Um, so I, I still think the Sounders team is going to be completely fine as it goes. They just need to get into the playoffs and do the Sounders thing that they always do, which is to kind of get right at the right time of the season. Um, I think that they're going to be able to carry forward a little bit of this momentum from the win, where once they get to actually like regroup and take a minute and train um, and get these guys back to playing, they've experienced playing it through meaningful matches and are way further along than the rest of 
uh, MLS uh, as far as their form goes and being able to play in those meaningful moments. So the challenge instead becomes how do you not just run them into the ground? And I think how do you deal with the injuries? And the big one is Zhao Paulo. Um, we, we talked about it in the post game show as far as um, you know the implications within the match. But when you look longer term, he's such a massive piece, an important part of it. And then they have a young players that they can trust, most notably Vargas, who came into the match at 16. They got a Tensio. Um, I think there's a number of guys that can play that role. Um, but I think they may need to go out and look to maybe make a make a move in the next transfer window to try to build to reach their goals, um, to try to build out a little bit more of experience and safety. So you build up these young players, you trust them for a while, they get a ton of minutes, but then you bring somebody in to reinforce, um, maybe looking towards the back half. But I think they're for sure a playoff team, and uh, I don't, nobody's going to want to see them in the playoffs. It doesn't matter where they where they finish really in the you realize they've too. never they've never finished lower than fourth in the western yeah, conference it's nuts yeah. it's not just that they make it every actually, year it's yeah. if they don't like they sneak in <laughs> every year um, I, I still think they'll, they'll finish top four in the western conference i'm not even convinced that they need to go out and make a move to replace Jao paulo with a veteran i think like they clearly believe in obed obed vargas he you know they would when they needed him in the CCL final, um, they turned to him. And granted, he wasn't great in that game, but he had been great earlier in CCL. And so they clearly trust him. He's a blue chip prospect. Um, it's a very clear path to minutes. And then the other thing is, like, Atencio played 2,000 minutes last year he did. For, for a 60-point team. You know, he's 20 years old. He's not a, you know, completely green kid anymore. And then, like, at one point, Leva was considered the best prospect of, of any of them. And now he's fallen off, but he's 19 years old, and, you know, he needs playing time as well. So I think between those three guys in Rusnak and Rowe, and maybe even Reed Baker Whiting, who I think is probably going to end up being more of an attacking player, um, but you never know, uh, I, I'm not convinced that they need to go out and, and replace Zhao Paulo, like, for, like, with a veteran. And I'm not... Uh, convinced that they will. Um, and I don't... I, I told everybody on Twitter, I voted them number one in the power rankings this week. I still think, like, it, look, at, look at what NYCFC did as soon as they finished with CCL. They came into ML, into league play and they started just stomping the hell out of everybody. Montreal basically did the same thing. Like, Seattle's very clearly that level of team. I think now that they have this, you know, hangover out of their system, they're going to start stomping next week. They will be a 60-point team by the end of the year. They will have at least one home playoff game. They're going to be a team that nobody wants to see in the postseason at all. Um, and I don't think anybody would be particularly shocked if they won another MLS Cup this year. That's what well, I, I expect. Only thing I'll say real quick is so much went through Xiao Paulo that I, I yeah. think playing those young players around him seemed to be a good fit. I worry it, that it puts a little bit too much pressure as like building ball progression and building out of the back and getting on the ball and maybe ask more of Ladero to drop deeper, which um, he can do. But I think that might be the only other reason why I think to go. But I, I hear what you're saying. Play, you know, play your kids. Yeah. You know it. Right. Look at we, we even converted Kale. like <laughs> that's my Rick. victory this week. We converted Kale and he's <laughs> fully on board. I didn't even sh I didn't even like blink my eye. Like I thought we had him there. I thought I thought we'd pushed him into that that corner a long time ago. Uh, all right, let's start running through some other stuff first so we can hit more. We're gonna, uh, we gonna talk about Dallas at all? No, just a good win for Dallas. Yeah, we'll get we'll, good. For, how about okay. we put him on the power ranking show tomorrow? Okay. That seems like a good a good compromise right. yeah, there. Yeah, go yeah. go. Uh, had a ton of people come up to say, "Hey, we love the MLS Today feed as well." MLS Today Power Ranking Show, MLS After Dark. So go subscribe to that. There is a lot more MLS talk where this came from. We try to fit as much we can into an hour fifteen, or as Anders would tell you, more like an hour thirty, uh, depending on how I'm hosting. But all right, let's keep going. LAFC two, Philadelphia two, our twenty two under twenty two. A lot of twos there. Player of the weekend presented by Body Armor is uh, Julian Carranza. A little too old here. We've done that before. Uh, but this is, you know, this is for Doyle. This is an abs. This is a, a just gift wrap it for Doyle. Julian Carranza, another goal, right for your Golden Boot squad, doing his thing. Uh, four <laughs> goals, three assists this season. Looks like the the player that Miami spent a lot of money to get uh, in a system that maximizes his uh, strengths and abilities. What are your uh, quick takeaways on this match for LAFC Philadelphia, Doyle? You it, you it, called it out as a great one. Yeah, it was, and it was. Part of it is that these are two elite teams, and part of it is that they're just elite in completely different ways. Like Steve Torondolo 
took over this LAFC side and he like he was very clever in that he did not feel the need to tear down everything and try to put his stamp on it from you know top to bottom um, he just took what was working added a few new pieces added I think a little more solidity so they're still one of the best pressing teams in the league. They are still probably the best team in the league with the ball. It's either them or NYCFC. Um, they have, I think, uh, more individual game breakers than just about anyone, though, as we be pointed out at the top of the show, like those guys aren't even hitting. It, you know, Carlos Vela has it, no, you know, no goals in his past eight games. Chicho Arango hasn't really... Um, gotten into a groove yet brian rodriguez has had moments but he's been hurt now i think four or five games um and they're still so solid overall this team um that they're going out there uh and they're beating most teams and when they came up against this philadelphia team that is we i think we all agree is excellent um they were able to come back come down from a goal behind twice and what was fun about it is that philly just skipped the midfield man with the way they're playing this year, it's just full-on Red Bull, verticality, 50-50s, go forward as quickly as possible, um, and, and, like, never stop running. And so it was just a, a very, like, styles make fights, and this was very much a styles make fights type of thing. And um, it got to the point where I think that Philly were so committed to what they were doing that they kind of forced Chirundolo's hand, and he, he took out Ilya Sanchez. Um, and Ilya's played, I think, every minute this year for LAFC, and he's like, he's so good at controlling the tempo. Well, Philly, when they were attacking, were just playing right over him, for one, and then when LAFC had the ball, they were man-marking him. They were just completely taking him out of the game. So, like, I think that Philly won the tactical battle in terms of defining how the game was played, but then LAFC have so much quality, and they're so damn good on restarts that they were able to come back and get the point anyway. Um, it's just like, if you like high level, intense soccer, um, and sometimes the MLS regular season can lack that. Uh, this game did not lack that. This game felt like a playoff game. This game felt like a potential MLS cup preview because I think these two teams are that damn good. All right. I'll, I'll hit the Austin one real quick for us. Austin, opportunity at home to pass LAFC in the Supporter Shield and Western Conference standings would have been tied on points, but tiebreakers, they would have had it. Had the Galaxy at home, but boy, was this one sloppy. Uh, from both sides, uh, to be honest. This was not Austin at their best, and you heard that, uh, what was it, halftime interview from from Josh Wolf? He's like, yeah, we're just like passing the ball out of bounds. <laughs> like, that's a bad sign. Uh, not creating chances, a little bit of the 2021 20, Austin that we saw. But the flip side, shout out to Mark Delgado, man. This has been his year with the Galaxy. He is the most important player on that team, Chicharito included. He apparently was telling people in training that he was going to score a goal, and that, that's not something that uh, I would believe from Mark Delgado if he was telling me in training. I'd be like, yeah, he, up. he didn't hesitate. sure. Yeah, from deep? Oh, yeah, you got this, Mark. Hit it, man. Hit it. And he, he banged it in. So congratulations to the Galaxy. A big road win for them. But you said at the top, I don't think that I learned anything about either team in this game that we – we didn't already have a little bit of an inkling about, other than, holy crap, how did Chicharito miss that chance? Yeah. <laughs> that ain't like going to happen that, much. It, that it's not, but like he's he's still getting after it every game. You could see some frustration because he should have had four other chances like that. Like, Efra Alvarez had a nightmare, and, um, you know, a few other of those attack Like, once Sasha Kleshin got on, it looked so much better for the Galaxy. Uh, but here's something that I did not realize. L.A. have only conceded one open play goal all year we're a shocking 10, 10 games into the season this team has been a disaster defensively since about 2015 um only one open play goal conceded this year for the, the galaxy uh i it they hadn't struck me as being that good defensively and i need to to go through the numbers and make sure that i'm seeing this correctly but like if you're doing that uh you're gonna have a pretty good season you have a real good Real good season. I know it's making Kalen's heart sink because, like, that is uh, Houston Dynamo soccer right there, just like clamping down from open play. But it's got to it's got to burn you up to see it happening in Carson. <laughs> no, it is. But I would say the one thing: anytime the Galaxy win is just devastating for me. Uh, <laughs> but but I think the one thing, and I asked this question kind of to begin the year was like, how how can the Galaxy win in ways that don't require Chicharito? 
going off, right? It doesn't all need to fall on him. And I think this game was kind of a perfect microcosm of saying, yeah, he was active, he was busy, but he wasn't necessarily on form. And in the past, we've seen them lose matches where he he scores one goal, but doesn't get the second or the third or scores two goals, and they need a third to be able to get three points. And this, I think they've revealed at this point, you know, a third of the way through the season, or however far we are, um, that they can win this way. They, they can go on the road, they can get a win um, like that. And they do it at, they, they've done it at home as well, too. Um, so, yeah, credit to Greg Vanny for getting that, that back line in shape. All right, uh, New England 2, Columbus 2, and then we'll hit some, some quick ones. We'll drive through it. Kalen, pretty, pretty crazy game. I mean, Columbus was controlling this thing in New England, and then, you know, I, I read your column, Doyle. Wasn't able to watch, but a tactical shift from Bruce and then another tactical shift from Bruce, and then Omar comes on and, hello, Hurtado Island. Eric Hurtado in here bangs at home, gets past him at the near post. What would you take away from this one? We're, we're still in that space with the Revs where it's still just kind of like, man, what are we, what are we watching? Yeah, are you asking uh, me? Or oh, Kaylin. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Doyle and I talked a little bit about this on MLS After Dark, which if you're not watching, you should, on Saturday. But, yeah, that tactical shift was interesting because um, I think uh, Bruce took out uh, Farrell at that point and went to three in the back. And – I think they also brought in Boateng, and they were able to suddenly get a lot more active, especially getting up the wings. Um, and they were able to get their outside backs involved. Um, you see the goal from Jones, who was great. And everything seemed to really be sort of flipping, switch on its head, where the Revs were suddenly in complete control, and they get the second goal, and then they make another change. And so Bruce, at that point, brings in Omar Gonzalez. I think they go back to four in the back. Mm-hmm. And... You know, taking out one center back and then going to three in the back and then putting back in another center back, it goes back to what I was talking about before with um, center back position and being a relationship position and a rhythm position more than anything. And to be able to have to put in and shift the back line that much through the scope of a match um, clearly didn't end up working. Now, Bruce, I think afterwards, came out and answered kind of in his gruff tone. Um uh, about you know the sort of thinking behind it, <laughs> uh, and far be it for me to I don't want anybody to pull up my win loss record against Bruce or anything, but I think you know today uh, you have to say that that move clearly didn't work in the match. And overall, there's a larger issue for New England. I think they've given up the most goals in the last 15 minutes of uh, matches in all of MLS, and last year was the complete inverse of that where they continued to pile on um and they ended up taking a lot of one point matches into three point matches um late on in games and this year it's been the exact opposite and at least for this weekend i think some of it came down to that switch uh we'll talk more about montreal on tuesday i think in the power ranking show got to get patrice bernier on to walk us through it but you know georgie continues to produce still question marks at striker and they're doing it i do have to shout out the montreal fan we met in seattle had a bjorn johnson jersey Bjorn Janssen. Yeah, Bjorn Janssen jersey, which is an ETR legend, uh, of course. That's commitment to the bit, to the show, to uh, everything we stand for. Orlando, Jekyll and Hyde, man, it's sometimes good and sometimes it's really poor. And this was uh, an instance for them of being pretty poor. So uh, they have issues at center back with all the injuries. Have maybe issues in figuring out what the best formation is for them, whether or not their best players can consistently be that quality. Uh, we'll talk more Montreal and maybe some Orlando on the Power Ranking Show. Let's hit some quick hits here. Nashville 2, Real Salt Lake, Salt Lake nothing. This was a whooping, just a stomping. Um, you know, Nashville's biggest strength, I think, is is one is Hani Mukhtar on. If he is, they are pretty devastating uh, in the counterattacking situation. And if he's not, uh, they can still manufacture chances. Just question who's going to score them. Dave Romney does on a set piece, good for him. And CJ Sapong, I love the hold up play and then the finish at the end. But they just put teams in positions where they cannot be successful like attacking, and they put RSL in those positions all day. RSL created absolutely nothing, and they really need to get some of these uh, these reinforcements in and figure something out going forward. By the way, Ake Lobo with a full half, had the full second half, didn't have a shot. Mm. So that, that ain't good. That ain't good. Mm. But if Hani gets going, this is a very good team that I think becomes great. So that's an if right now. His underlying numbers are great, but his actual goal scoring is not. Charlotte won against Inter-Miami. Congratulations to Andre Shinashiki. Uh, off the plane, right onto the score sheet. Good for him. That's what the trade was for, to give him more opportunities. A great finish at the back post. And just nonsensical, what in the hell are you doing transition defending from Inter-Miami? I mean, they had like a, a six-man flat back line in which they were watching Charlotte pass the ball around and turn into transition. So that, that was that was pretty poor. Uh, but four straight wins at home for Charlotte. Doyle, uh, draw between the Red Bulls and Portland. What would you see? Uh, the Red Bulls finding a way not to win at home yet again. They, they're 5-0-0. They've taken 
15 from a possible 15 road Makes points. Makes no sense. They've taken three of a possible 15 home points. Uh, it, it It is, yeah, it makes no sense. It does um, make sense a little bit, but it also makes no sense. Yeah, it, well, the way it makes sense is, like, teams come out and play when you're on the road, right? If, if teams, when they're at home, feel a little more responsibility to, to kind of take the ball and take the game and play through the middle and all that. And if you're a pressing team, that is what you want to see because you, you can turn that into chances. At home, um, you know, the Red Bulls are facing teams that just sort of bury themselves in, in front of their goalkeeper, and that's kind of what Portland did in this one. Um, so it's tougher to necessarily turn that into chances. That said, you know, the Red Bulls have been a pressing team for almost a decade now. And even under Jesse Marsh and Chris Armas, the home road split uh, traditionally that we see in MLS kind of held up and it's just, it's just completely gone this year. There is a mitigating circumstance in that, um, you know, Patrick Lamala, who might've had his breakout game last weekend, he missed this one. I believe he was in, uh, you know, medical protocol. Um, Ashley Fletcher, uh, had, I think muscle tightness. He has not been good since he arrived, but, you know, he has an EPL pedigree, so I think the expectation is that he's going to be good. So they were down to Tom Barlow, who, you know, has had a number of chances to show that he's Say an not a guy. not a negative word. Don't you dare. Right. Okay. I will protect so, young Tom in Goss's absence. But the point is um, that the Red Bulls are finding ways to give up points at home. And uh, it is weird to see because they are playing so well in so many ways. Uh, usually MLS teams find a way to turn that into uh, – into into wins and, and you know good point here for the timbers uh, where is home for nycfc kalen we changes by the week it was city field this week and the weather was miserable sporting kansas city in but town that camera angle in city field the camera angle for that game is incredible i'll always watch them <laughs> in city field i told you before my friend charlotte she's only been to one match and it's been at city field she just thinks that's where they play <laughs> Nil nil here. Uh, they had all of the ball against Kansas City. Any big, any takeaways, big or small, medium sized? Uh, no, I say good, good point for Sporting. Just they were in desperate need of it, and NYCFC had been in, you know, great form, scoring a ton of goals, and you had to kind of play to the conditions. It was just a wet, kind of awful environment to um, try and play through. And Sporting, I don't think they had much of the ball. It seemed like. I don't, know, I don't know what their final possession stats they had like were. Like none of the ball. I think they had a 25% or something. <laughs> yeah. It was low. Um, but ultimately, like, that's what you need sometimes to get through one. So I thought it was a good point for them on the road. All right, D.C. with a big win, 2 nothing. against Houston at home. Taxi Fountas looks the part. He's playing the part. Uh, you know, another two goals. That's four goals and an assist in, like, 250 minutes. And good goals, too. So, uh, well, sometimes that's not sustainable. You know, we've you've heard us say that about Driussi as well, but – Looks like a really smart signing by D.C. to, one, sign the dude, but two, to spend the money to get him early uh, in order to score these goals to get yeah, them results. My, my Dynamo didn't do themselves any favors. Yeah, going to go on the road, <laughs> defending set pieces, and then Lundqvist just kind of takes a little bit too big of a bite. Um, but, yeah, good for D.C., but I, I, that one stung for me. Oh, Dynamo. Yeah, three straight losses for Houston. So uh, that's four without a win. So they have now fallen below. The playoff line out in the West, San Jose, Colorado. You can see our take uh, on the Nathan uh, handball or non-handball that should be a handball, I should say, uh, on instant replay. Charlie and I both agreed on that one. You might be able to guess uh, which way we fell and that the Colorado probably should have gotten a point out of this one. Doyle, any uh, any takeaways here? Uh, two big takeaways. One is that it, things are just kind of more sane under Alex Cavello than uh, they were under uh, <laughs> Matias Almeida. <laughs> I, I mean, it, you know, JT Marshankowski, like, he came out and he said it after the game. He's like, you know, a lot of the pressing stuff that Almeida did, we owe, the, we owe him and his staff a lot. Um, but under the new head coach, it's kind of a less is more approach, which I thought was a really funny way of putting it. But if you watch the Quakes now, it, it almost always looks like a normal soccer game. Now, Francisco Calvo is still playing. So there are like there was like a moment in the 83rd minute the Quakes are up one nil they just had a huge let off because of the no call and the Nathan handball, um, you know against a against a Rapids team that is struggling, and 
for some reason, Francisco Calvo has decided that he's playing midfield for five minutes. So the Quakes are just like randomly shifted into a, a back three instead of like a, a straightforward 4 2 3 1. So you're going to get a little of that, but it's not as baked into um, the team's DNA as it had been under Almeida. And uh, lo and behold, they have won three of four games uh, since Almeida uh, and the Quakes parted ways. Uh, final one from the weekend we'll hit here. Vancouver, Toronto. Again, an IR plug for you on this one. Congratulations to our guy, Toussaint Ricketts, for the game winner late on. He had one taken away against Montreal, rightfully so, a couple of weeks ago. But that was a, a big moment for him against his former team, Toronto FC. But might not should have might not have been a three-point uh, outing for Vancouver had there not been a referee call that did not go their way. Uh, Jaden Nelson scored a goal. Goal was called uh, off. Blow the whistle. Victor Rivas says, no, no, there's a foul there. Well... Uh, the VAR did not flag this one for review, but it is very clear, I think, that it should have been. There was no control by Thomas Assal. Now, Thomas Assal got hurt on the play, probably from the ball being kicked through his hand, which he's reaching out to block, but uh, tough times for Bob Bradley and Toronto. Not playing particularly well and getting a little unlucky in this sense. Uh, well, not a little. More than a little bit unlucky in this sense. Uh, yeah, he had said afterwards, hey, that, that's a mistake. We'll see what comes of it. But in this case, what comes is no points for Toronto and three for Vancouver. All right, let's get into the uh, the mailbag here. Alistair Brewer, center square erased, free space gone. Is free space gone, guys? Is it is it dead? I don't know. You're the, still arbi- you're the arbiter of this, Weeby. I believe it still is is alive and well. Okay. I don't think that free space has been eliminated uh, because one one of many. You know, it's like everybody wins bingo. It's if you play bingo for twenty years, you're gonna win one game, right? Yeah. Like this is like a more of a reprieve. Yeah, this this was just like, oh wow, this time I didn't need free space. You know, I got I like lined them up on the right side or the left side or the top or the bottom. I didn't have to go across the middle. It wasn't blackout, etc. Like we're a long way from blackout. We're we've been at a different kind of blackout, and and we're trying to uh, get some momentum going. Thank God for the Sounders for just getting us over the hump. David and Skokie, congratulations, guys. The more free spaces you've racked up, see this free space thing had legs. <laughs> the sweeter tonight's victory. There are only two things that have ever made me cheer for the Sounders. David Ochoa and this CCL run. This year, I'm MLS for Seattle. Here's the many more disappointment-free nights of CCL. Uh, speaking of, is this a Roger Bannister breaks the four-minute mile situation where once an MLS team wins CCL, others will recognize the possibility and start winning these more regularly, or is this a one-off? In other words, how many CCL titles do MLS teams win over the next 10 years? I'll set the over-under Ooh, at good. three and a half. I'll take the under. But I like I three feels like the right the right number for that. Yeah, that sounds right to me. I think yeah. just under. But I I do think when you look at just how many teams are making it to consistently making it to semifinals or making it to finals uh, since 2017, um, this was not like 2011. Uh, this was not like 2014. These were a li- there is a lot more data I think that shows that teams are consistently getting there now. Finally, getting over the hump is another thing, but yeah, I could absolutely see it. It just depends on. It kind of depends on the model, and I think y- that your team does. I think that's one thing that you guys covered so well leading up to the match, and um, you know we talked about with Garth even afterwards was like, teams have to actually build their teams to target this, and if you otherwise, and I think sometimes for teams like we've seen in the past, Atlanta United who. I think could have won CCL easily, uh, or maybe not easily, but that team was good enough to win CCL. But the model was a little different that there was going to be turnover and it's harder to find that same type of success. So that's part of the challenge. Yeah, I thought, I thought Garth Lagerway, he, he's very bullish on the fact that this is going to be sort of a, uh, to use David and Skokie, the legend, uh, words, a Roger Bannister moment that this sort of like gradual progression, more and more semifinalists, and okay, more and more finalists, okay, somebody wins it is going to be. Um, you know, is is going to build momentum, and MLS will start breaking through more often. I had somebody else tell me, hey, I think it's going to be like three of the next five. I'm not that bullish. I also think we don't know what 2024 and beyond is going to look like with the, a, a new format with some tweaks and some differences in how uh, teams qualify. I will I will be the one that says an over on three and a half. Do I think it's going to yes. be like six? Hell no. Do I think that four, maybe Maybe five is possible. <laughs> it is possible. I'm going to say the over, and it's just like sneaking over at four. Uh, but there's also Leagues Cup that's going to, I think, help MLS in the sense that more and more teams will have the experience of playing these high leverage matches against League MX, which the Seattle Sounders used in this instance to build confidence and experience. So I'm saying four. God knows I'm still naive about this tournament. 
ready to have or my or maybe uh, five or, 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 maybe. or you know may, you gotta, you gotta You're open leave to it. leave your heart open to the possibility that we'll that we'll start winning fifty percent after winning our first ever uh, <laughs> Drew from Seattle. <laughs> If the next Club World Cup is this new 2014 format that's being discussed, is that bad or good for the Sounders? He says the bad, uh, since there would be three teams from CONCACAF, having one CCL may feel less important, especially if Pumas go two for being the runner-up uh, or you know if another MLS team qualifies somehow. And also bad, the new format would be flooded with Coma Bowl and UEFA teams, so less chance of advancing far. The good, according to Drew from Seattle... Uh, more visibility and attention to the tournament under the new format with more teams competing and a pretty much guaranteed competitive match against a UEFA team in the tournament. So good or bad for the Sounders. And, and also just Club World Cup thoughts for the Sounders. Yeah, so uh, first I just need the, the people to know that Andres is, is absolutely on one in the chat right now t- talking about talking about the Seattle being the, the CONCACAF Real Madrid in winning four titles in the <laughs> Being next around him years. after the game, and we had gotten shout-out to Paul in Seattle, who kindly, kindly gifted us a full case of wine as a, you know, just said, hey, look, I've enjoyed your content over the years. It's got me through drives. Here's a case of wine for you. He owns a, a, a wine shop. And, Paul, if you, if you give us the okay, we'll put out where that wine shop is so people can support you. Uh, yeah, being around him, wine drunk. <laughs> After the Seattleers won CCL, mm. made the Red chat look like, yeah, made made the chat look like nothing. Oh God. Um, anyway, <laughs> I think that the I, I understand the points that that the the that Drew was making about the the expansion of the Club World Cup, maybe diluting it slightly or putting the Sounders in less favorable brackets. Like that is, like that is valid. Um, what I think is more valid is that the Club World Cup as a tournament sucks right now. It absolutely sucks. It's not, it's over in, you know, a week and a half. It, it is generally not fun to watch if they expand it to 24 or honestly, eventually 32, because I think 32 is the perfect size for these types of tournaments. Um, and, you know, spread it out over a month, make it a real event like that. Um, that raises the profile of the tournament, which then has an actual trickle down effect, not like the economic one, which does not exist, um, <laughs> where uh, it, it raises the profile of the uh, tournaments and qualification methods around the world, including CCL. So I hope that like the sooner they expand to 24, the better, as far as I'm concerned, because Club World Cup should be you know, one of the most spectacular things in the world of soccer. And that would only be a benefit to MLS in the wrong, in the long run. Also gives the, uh, the fire a chance to win the world cup. And on that note, we're out of here. 401 206 MLS extra time at MLS soccer.com. Hope you enjoyed this show. Uh, it's great to be, to be back in familiar confines talking about uh, MLS. But, man, being in Seattle was an absolute pleasure, a joy, a bucket list experience. I will never, ever forget it. So thank we you, know. all of you. We know, know, Evie. We yeah, know. You know. We all, all right, know. Okay. All right. That's it for us. You really loved it, man. Uh, really? Yep. Yep. Uh, not, you know, not, not to get too overexcited. Okay. Okay. We're out of here. We're out of here. Adios. Adios. We'll see you Thursday. Congratulations, you made it through more than an hour of extra time. That means you love the show. And if you love the show, you probably want more episodes. Click right here for more episodes of extra time and here to subscribe to the MLS YouTube channel. Thanks for following along.